Good afternoon, everybody. The Noonday Gun in Cape Town, where our studio's base has just gone off. And thank you for joining us and welcome to REI Talk. It's our weekly investment webinar brought to you by Real Estate Investor. And today's investment webinar is sponsored by WealthTrack, protecting your wealth from economic and political uncertainty. My name is Neil Peterson. I'm the founder of Real Estate Investor, South Africa's leading independent digital real estate platform for over 14 years, geared for investors, landlords, developers, property practitioners, and entrepreneurs. REI's multi-channel content is delivered by our specialist team of journalists, content specialists, industry and marketing experts, all passionate about serving you, that's right, the real estate industry and investors uh, to over 300,000 people in real estate investors community. So you can connect with REI's thought-leading content, news and education via remag.co.za, that's our digital content platform, which includes podcasts, videos, eBooks, and property guides. And Remag, our digital interactive magazine, our live virtual events and masterclasses, and also our bespoke REI virtual 3D conference space and REI 3D meeting room in Spatial Web, which is one of our brand new marketing platforms. So I'm really excited to be your host and moderator for today's investment webinar. And uh, today's topic is learning to invest in the UK. And that is without living in the UK, and even if you only have a South African passport. So to our discussion today, learning to invest in UK property without living in the UK, and even if you only have a South African passport, we do know that a large contingent of active investors invest in real estate as their choice. Uh, it is a proven itself many times over as a solid investment. And one of the key questions in investing is always, where do you invest, local or offshore? Now, both options have their pros and cons for different types of investors under different circumstances. And today, we will learn as to how we can start investing in the UK from experienced investors and mentors, Sean and Peter, and I'm gonna introduce you to them shortly, and or they'll introduce themselves. So today we also discuss the challenges, the opportunities of investing offshore, specifically in the UK market. And we invite you to participate actively in this webinar. So without further ado, let's meet our two uh, expert panelists for today. First of all, Sean, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, good morning. Well, good afternoon, sorry, uh, Neil and all of the uh, attendees uh, today. My name is Sean Thompson. I've been investing in the UK property market for uh, just over 17 years now. Can you believe it? It's like to feel a bit old. Um, I live in Klettenberg Bay uh, in beautiful South Africa and uh, have been doing so for the past five years. So inherently practice what we teach all of our students is I live here uh, and I invest in uh, in UK property. So, you know, that's in, in exactly what we've set up WealthTrek uh, to do is how to, how to guide people down that journey effectively. Fantastic. It's great having you on board, Sean, and we look forward to, to hearing how you did it. Peter, can you introduce yourself to the, uh, to the audience, please? G good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Pete Martinison. I'm a uh, co-owner and director of WealthTrek. Um, I live in Johannesburg, um, and um, I'm an active property investor in the UK. I I started my journey reasonably recently, um, but uh, I am going to be taking you through a few of my recent transactions that I've that I've done in the UK, and I'm looking forward to sharing those with you a little, little bit later on in the presentation. Wonderful, great, Peter. It's great uh, having you on board, and yeah, I look forward to seeing how you did it. It's always interesting. So, Sean, before we begin, maybe you can start off with your story as to when and how you started investing in the UK market. Because, uh, you know, and I said up front, you know, there's a lot of political uncertainty and economic uncertainty. And, you know, obviously the UK has been quite a stable market. But um, there's a lot of people that want to know. Can you tell us, where did it all start? Yeah, absolutely, Neil. I mean, I went to the UK like a lot of South Africans did at the start of the, of, of the millennium, of 2000. Uh, went out there to seek fame and fortune, um, and uh, I did what everyone has to do when you get there because your rams don't go too far. Is I, I, I landed myself a, a job, um, and I, I sort of realised pretty much, well, relatively quickly into that job, uh, working for the, the Daily Mail, the, the Daily Mail newspaper in the UK, <laughs> that, that this wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So 
Um, you, you know, I think the, 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 the key is, is sort of understanding and, and sort of getting to grips, uh, you know, with, with life at that age, I suppose. And uh, it, it took me a while, you know, being from Nelspreet, you know, I'm a little bit slow. So I think it was the end of 2003, uh, I was in, a, in OR Tambo Airport. Uh, I wasn't in a very good place uh, emotionally because I wasn't doing something that was fulfilling me. I wasn't passionate about waking up and going to, to work at the Deadly Mail. Um, financially, I wasn't in such a good place either. And I, I picked up a book, which I'm sure a lot of your, uh, you know, a lot of your um, attendees, uh, you know, across the board would have read, which is Rich Dad Poor Dad. I know that you've had the pleasure of, of interviewing Robert Kiyosaki in the past. And, uh, and that mm -hmm. book really lit a spark in me. It got my tail wagging. It got me really thinking about you know, how things potentially could be different for, for me um, and for my future. And uh, um, that was the end of 2003, went back to the UK, it was dark and dingy. I read that book, literally the fastest I've ever read a book in my life, it took me about five <laughs> days. Um, everything was in dollar signs, unfortunately, but one of the things he says in the book is, is go and find people who are doing what you want to do. And that got me into a into a room, a seminar room in June of 2004. And I met a, a chap called Mark Dalton, who I fondly refer to as my, my rich dad. Um, and, and he's been a, a, a massive part of me as a, as a mentor, if you like, over, over the last 17 years. We're still very, very good friends. Um, and that was the, the, the spark being lit effectively, um, you know, and uh, he got me to take that, that first step, if you like, uh, into buying uh, those first property deals. They always say the first deal is the hardest. And let me tell you, um, it absolutely was. And I think that's where you need the most help, support and guidance is, is at the start. And uh, and like I say, 17 years later, I'm still actively investing in the UK property market. I've uh, been living in South Africa now in Plet for the last five years and, uh, and really trying to inspire and motivate and give people a plan B moving forward. So they have uh, opportunity and they can prevent their wealth uh, from being eroded, you know, for future generations effectively. Fantastic. So Sean, before we come back to you to ask you about some of your investment strategies, I know Peter, you're fairly new, but you, you're breaking into the UK market. And I'd just like you to also just share with the audience just briefly how you got and how you started as well. And uh, I know you've been visited into South Africa, but you know, obviously now we're going into the UK, just maybe just give the, the audience just a little bit of your, your background where, where you started too. Yeah, so, so Neil, it, it all really started um, with, with starting WealthCheck as a business. I mean, I've obviously known Sean for um, ages and ages. We've been at school together and we're best mates. And uh, two years ago, I um, joined him and we, we started WealthCheck. And obviously, if, if I'm going to, I, didn't, I haven't previously owned property before starting um, WealthCheck. And obviously, it was important if we are going to be as as a company teaching people how to invest in in UK property. I run the business side, but it is important for me um, to you know practice what I preach. So with that, I, I followed the process that um, that WealthTrek and, and Sean teaches. And mm -hmm. starting with that, I've, I've now just recently reserved my my third property um, in the UK. Fantastic. So, so yeah, no, it's awesome. a, we're going to hear story. about that, Peter. That's great. That's yeah. wonderful. And I think, you know, that's, that's what inspires people to kind of move forward. And uh, so, yeah. So, Sean, starting with you again, um, you know, tell us some of the investment strategies that you've applied. And because uh, I'm sure that's where a lot of people are probably sitting over here and they're saying, listen, I'd love to get into the UK market. How do I get in? So, so maybe share that. Sure, Neil. I mean, I think um, we actually talk about something on our UK Discovery Series, which is, uh, we call it the Wealth Triangle. It's about starting, um, you know, really starting at the, at the bottom of the Wealth Triangle with a, a low risk, low return strategy, um, you know, so where things are, are going to be a bit more simple, you know. So, so if there is a mistake, it's not the end of the world. Um, you can recover from that. Um, and I think that is, is massively important. And I followed that process 17 years ago. I started uh, living in London, obviously, uh, property prices, like I'm sure everyone knows, massively expensive in London. You know, I think at the moment you probably pay six, seven hundred thousand pounds for a little one or two bedroom flat in central London, and you can't even swing a cat around in that thing. So, so for me, the, the <laughs> idea and the concept of buying in London just didn't exist. I knew that I had to move out of London. Um, and, and we actually started buying property in a little, a tiny little cotton mill, ex cotton mill town just north of Manchester called Burnley. 
Um, you know, we followed that, that idea of low risk, low return. So the first uh, three bedroom terraced house I bought, 26,000 pounds. Can you believe it? I'll never forget the, the figures. We spent 5,000 pounds refurbishing it. Um, it valued up uh, shortly thereafter at 42,000 pounds. So we're actually able to refinance and recycle that initial investment into, into building, a, uh, building a portfolio. Um, you know, having a look at, at other places, I've bought property in Liverpool, I've invested in, in London. Um, about 11 years ago, um, I started focusing on South Wales, which funny enough is where a lot of our wealth check clients do start buying because obviously low valued property units, if you have a look at some of the stuff that Pete's buying, some of our other students are buying, um, you know, it allows a lot of ordinary South Africans to be able to get into, uh, into the market. So. Um, I've done a, you know, buying and selling property there. I've done social housing, which we talk about quite a lot. Um, but now primarily, Neil, I, I focus on um, commercial to residential development. So, so taking um, pubs, commercial properties and converting them back into residentials. A massive, massive demand in the UK market for residential property. The, the government hasn't been building enough property there for the last 15, 16 years. Um, so a lot of incentives to, to be able to bring re residential property back to life. And one of the, you know, one of the things they've looked at is commercial real estate and converting that back into resi, um, as well as land development. And in fact, I've just uh, uh, exchanged contracts on a, on a hotel. So that monopoly strategy of buying those three greenhouses and buying big red hotels. Now, that's, that's the type of thing I'm doing now, but that's not where we encourage people to start. We, we obviously encourage people to follow a process, a strategy, um, you know, and, and get into the UK market from that perspective. Okay, awesome. I mean, there, there's quite a lot to absorb and I, and I know that you go through a process in that in terms of training and mentoring people through that process. And I mean, so, so Sean, I think one of the questions is obviously, you know, with the pandemic, I mean, we've been in hard lockdown since March, end of March, uh, 2020. So, I mean, how has, uh, you know, because WealthCheck's been around for, for a while as part of this process. So maybe just share how that started and also how your investment uh, sort of strategy and WealthCheck in collectively hand in hand evolved with the onset of the pandemic and also probably pertaining to the UK market. So maybe do you want to just share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, I, I've always had a, a passion for, uh, lighting the flame of possibility in other people, just like my rich dad did for me in 2004. That's become a real, a real passion for me. And, and, and you know, I've, I've been fortunate to mentor for Robert Kiyosaki for many years. Uh, I've spoke uh, or been to, to lots of places around the world, Australia, Europe, UK, South Africa, to speak about property investment and obviously more specifically UK property investment strategies. So, so it was about, you know, 2016, moved back to Plet. Um, you know, I, I could see the opportunity, you know, a lot of normal South Africans wanting to get money out of South Africa, um, not necessarily just high net worth individuals, but, but normal guys, uh, you know, at a bribe talking about, you know, looting or corruption that had happened or prescribed assets where the government's taking, you know, hold of your pension money and investing it into state owned entities. Uh, the currency, interest rate, all those things that we're not here to talk about, you know, that, that is mm. a lot of bright talk. So the, the, the idea of that plan B, um, you know, is what people talk about. So, um, you know, I think, I think the bottom line was that people wanted to get into property, you know, in, you know, offshore property. I mean, I'm sure you would be the first to agree, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not reinventing the wheel, you know, that, that no. is a buzzword and has been for a long time. Um, I think the, I the, the, bottom, the, the bottom line was looking at how we could help normal people, you know, not million pound property deals and, and how we could, um, you know, um, allow them into a system, okay, that I think is a, a bit more unique and Pete, you know, sort of touched on the fact that buying something, refurbishing and then refinancing, that sort of idea was really what we focused on. So. Pete said it, we've been friends for way too long. I think uh, we were 12 years old when we met first at uh, Pretoria Boys High School. Um, he's obviously got a background in education, the seminar industry. Um, I think for me as well, he sort of touched on it, but, but I, I could feel the hunger that he wanted to get, you know, he bought some property in South Africa, but wanted to get property into the UK market. Um, so there was that certain hunger there. So we, we sat down, we put our heads together. We thought about how this could work, um, you know, effectively how we could create an educated, South African investor buying into the UK property market. And then on the other side of the coin, leveraging 
you know, a network that's taken me 17 years to, to build. So um, interestingly enough, the initial idea, you know, was live seminars, was buying trips into the UK market. That was November 2019. Very shortly after that, boom, COVID happened. Um, so we had to pivot and we had to look at, at what we could do. Um, and, and obviously, I think, um, you know, what happened was, was WealthTrek took a lot of their training online. And I think that that's been a, a blessing in disguise because it's not something I was thinking about or people's thinking about at the time. Um, and, and I think COVID, COVID allowed us from a WealthTrek perspective to, to, to pivot and to create an online sort of program that people could do from the comfort of their own homes. But I think, I think the other side of the coin was that a lot of, you know, UK is quite traditional in many respects, Neil. So, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, opening your bank accounts, they want to meet you, you know, uh, meeting your mm. solicitor for identity checks, all that, they want to meet you. So they almost had to, had to sort of steamroll and fast track, if you like, um, the technology side. So, you know, the meeting on Zooms and all that type of thing um, allowed us to be able to get people buying property in the UK without having to go there. So to do it completely virtually. And, uh, you know, so COVID played into our hands from that perspective and really got us into uh, a position to be able to get people to do that, you know, to buy virtually, to do it during a pandemic and, and to have success, you know, from that perspective too. So it's been a really awesome two years, I must say, and we've helped a lot of people. Um, and that's exciting from our perspective in terms of growing, you know, growing the business moving forward. That's fantastic. So, I mean, both of you come from the school of uh, the number one billionaire in the world, Elon Musk, and our Rugby World Cup champion, John Smith. So, <laughs> so Peter, I want to come over to you now. Um, I mean, with the onset of the uh, pandemic, um, as uh, Sean was sharing with us, most investors and uh, thought it's probably a better time rather to wait and see, probably don't invest at all. Um, you personally have operated quite differently in this period. And maybe you can share us, you know, you know how you did it. And uh, I mean, you mentioned you're on deal three at the moment. And uh, so what is your virtual pandemic buying strategy being? And, you know, Sean, you're welcome to, to jump in. Too. So, Peter, over to you. Yeah, I think, Neil, you know, I, I, I needed, I, I, like I said, I've, I've wanted to be, I've wanted to buy a property in the UK, um, you know, from the, from the outset of, of creating WealthTrek. And um, for me, it was important just to get going, you know. So whether there was a pandemic or not, there were still opportunities to buy in the UK. You could buy a property virtually. You could set everything up from South Africa in terms of, setting up a structure, opening bank accounts, being introduced to solicitors. So, so in actual fact, the, the pandemic also almost created a bit of an opportunity, you know, with a lot of those systems that you'd have to go through and processes that you'd have to set up, or nearly you'd have to go and meet the guys in person. Um, so, so it created an opportunity to actually do everything, um, you know, from South Africa without going to the UK. And, um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I sort of leveraged Sean's um, huge amount of knowledge and, um, and, and got going, you know, there's, there's, there's never a better time to get going than right now. And, and I sort of took that on and, and, um, and, and pressed the button and, and, and bought property there. And it's, yeah, it's, it's been a fantastic experience, you know, I'll, I'll share one of my deals um, a little bit later on, um, but but it's been it's been a fantastic experience. Awesome, great. So um, I think now we want to get into sort of some of the the mechanics of of the investing, and um, you know, so I'm I'm pretty excited that this fact that you guys have took the the step going forward. So Sean, I mean, I know you call it investment secrets. I, I rather say investment pr principles because you're actually going to let the secret out. <laughs> and remember, <laughs> secrets shouldn't be secret. You, you've got to get it out. But, uh, but you're going to share that with us now, um, you know, on your journey in UK investments. So maybe you can tell us what are those three big investment secrets or investment principles? Because I think that's quite important. Everybody has a certain way and they found a certain, certain things to work for them really well. So we'd love you to hear what you've got to share with us on those secrets. Well, awesome, Neil. If you don't mind, I'm, I've actually prepared a presentation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share okay. that presentation now. 
correct um, stuff. And, and just really go through what, what I think is, is massively important for people who, who, who are considering going into the UK, are considering property as a vehicle to be able to invest in. Um, you know, uh, three secrets, principles of UK property investing. Um, a lot of people ask me and have asked me over time, you know, uh, a South African, a foreign national or an expat investor, can they get lending in the UK? So I just wanted to touch on the lendability of, um, you know, South Africans. Um, you know, how do you find good property deals? You know, example, they're looking at Pete sitting here in Joburg. How, how has he managed over uh, the course of the last 12 to 18 months to buy three properties that are, are going to make him a, you know, a, a really good amount of money? So, uh, you know, how, how do you get those property deals coming and landing in your lap? I think that's something for people to understand and get their heads around. Um, and then I'm not a big new build, uh, a, a big believer in the new build model, which, which is, a, you know, where a lot of people and South Africans invest their money, you know, I want to explain, uh, certainly from the UK perspective, why, why I think it's something uh, people should try and avoid if possible. So, so let me go into the, the lendability first, uh, first off, you know, I think, um, you know, I think the bottom line with, with lendability, Neil, is, is that if someone were to, to phone up a, uh, a high street bank, HSBC, Barclays, today after the webinar, and they'd say, look, you know, my, my name is uh, Johan van Veek, and I'd love to buy a, a property in London. Can I get lending? Okay. The, the, the high street bank will say absolutely no, because what they want to know is where are you resident? And if you're resident all the way here in South Africa, okay, you, you won't get lending. So calling a high street bank is an absolute no, no. I think the most important thing um, that you need to have and the, the most important member of your team in terms of funding obviously is going to be a broker. So a couple of things about a broker that you would need would first of all be someone who's independent. Maybe uh, you guys want to write that down. So what does an independent broker means? It means that they are uh, effectively can access the whole of the market. Okay, they're not tied to one or two lenders specifically. And, and there are hundreds of lenders in the UK. So you're going to need someone who can see and access the whole of the market to be able to get you lending. Um, the other thing I, I would say is, is massively important is that they would need a specialization in foreign and expat mortgages. So on our, our UK discovery series, we actually explain to the difference between a foreign national versus an expat. Um, but that would need to be a specialism for them having placed finance for people who don't reside uh, within the UK. So that is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, a couple of key differences between the UK and South Africa, very quick on the finance side. Um, key difference number one is, is massive. You know, I think it's, it's interest only finance, which means, uh, you know, if you have a look at the base rates in the UK at the moment, um, which is the repo rate effectively, 0.1%, it's the lowest it's ever been in history, okay? So it's a great time to be lending money, not a great time to be saving money effectively. Um, and, and I think the great thing from, from this perspective is you can get relatively cheap finance, which means you can get property investment properties on an interest only basis. You can get them to cash flow pretty much from day one, okay? It means we're not waiting 10, 15 years for a property to become cash flow positive. Uh, you know, once you've got a tenant in that property and it's been refurbished, okay, it's going to put money into your pockets. Um, I think if you have a, have a look over here at, at this little graph that I prepared for you guys, uh, a couple of things there, you know, lending wise with the, the base rates at 0.1%, a foreign national and expat can expect 5 to 6% on an interest only basis. That's what our, our students are currently getting out there in the marketplace with loan to values in the region initially, okay, uh, of roughly 65 to 70%. So, so, so that is pretty, po pretty positive, but I want to I just add on to that, okay? Uh, I've already said you can't really invest in your own name. Well, you can, but you're not going to get lending. So if you want to get lending, the structure you set up is massively important. So what you invest through, something we talk about in depth on our UK discovery series. Uh, and the great thing about that structure is, is if you set it up correctly, um, over time, okay, that structure will, will produce a credit rating. And the credit rating will allow you effectively, once you've submitted uh, annual financial statements and so on, uh, you've got lending through that structure and, and people talk about the first deal that he's done here, he's got lending through it. Um, you know, you'll have the opportunity to decrease those interest rates over time and increase the loan to value, uh, the, the loan to values effectively. So that structure builds a credit rating in the UK for you if set up correctly over time, which allows you to get even better lending once the credit stripes effectively have been earned. So the other thing I like about the UK, just looking at that, that graph very quickly is... Uh, 
you can see how stable the interest rates have been through the last, uh, you know, through the last decade. There's been two interest rate increases. Um, they can't decrease the interest rates anymore because they're at the lowest point they've ever been at 0.1%. Um, and for me, I like stability. That's why I like the UK market. Um, you know, if you have a look at what uh, has happened. Um, Neil, the second key difference, which is also key, is, is the ability to be able to, to build a portfolio. And, 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 and this is why I love UK property, because I'm very much, um, you know, and, and Wealthtrek and, and Pete, we're very much in the, in the marketplace of encouraging people to buy dirty, smelly properties. In fact, the dirtier, the smellier, <laughs> the better, if that makes sense. Um, the smell is the smell of money. That's what I've always been told, and, and that's what I believe. So, the, the ability to buy something that's dirty, smelly, um, you know, refurbish it, okay, fix it up. That, that for me is where you make your money. That that refurbishment process allows you to increase the value of the property, okay. And, and once you've increased the value of the property, you have the ability to refinance that property. So you can refinance at the higher value which allows you to release a percentage of your money into future property deals. And that's pretty cool because you can do that within six months. So you can buy something dirty, money, fix it up. Okay. It's worth more. You go back to the bank, you refinance at the higher value, you pull out some of your initial investment and you can you know, invest that into further property deals uh, moving forward. So what that means is you're not tying up huge amounts of capital um, at a low return on investment, you know, in, in one or two property deals. And, and this certainly is a process we, we teach on our discovery series. We go into far more depth and give you a bit more detail, uh, you know, on how that works. So that, that is, is the first thing. I think the, the, the second key secret or key principle I'm going to call them from now on, Neil, is, is, how, is how to secure good uh, quality um, negotiation you know, below market value property deals. So you're getting them below what they're worth. Um, you're getting something that's dirty and smelly. How, how do you do that? Um, you know, when you're 13,000 miles away from where you're investing. Um, and, and the solution to that is, is pretty simple. You, you need someone on the ground who's going to be able to do all of the legwork for you. Um, you know, they say to every problem, there's a solution. And in this case, the solution is utilizing a property sourcing agent. So so what is a property sourcing agent? First of all, it's the opposite to an estate agent. So an estate agent works on behalf of the seller of a property. A sourcing agent works on your behalf. So effectively a buyer's agent, okay? Um, they do all the legwork. Um, they get out there. They, you know, they've got adverts out. They're visiting estate agents. They're viewing properties. They're putting offers out. And their job effectively is to bring you a negotiated property deal and they charge you a fee for that, okay? So, so they work as part of your team. Um, a couple of things about sourcing agents, they, they need, like an estate agent in the UK, need to have a certain level of compliance um, in order to, to legally accept monies for charging a commission to find deals. I'll give you two here very quickly. You know, I know we're limited in time, so they need to be registered to the property ombudsman in the UK, and they need to be regulated for any anti-money laund anti -money laundering supervision. Okay, quite a big word there for a, a South African guy. So, so on the UK Discovery Series, we go through you know the five um, you know the five compliance uh, you know levels. We go through that in detail so that you that you know um, how to vet a sourcing agent in the UK and make sure that you've got. The right one because i say beware you know glossy brochures sometimes people um know you know they, they know how to make deals a lot better than they look so i think that understanding from an education perspective compliance how to vet someone and then b you know how to how to run the due diligence on any deal you're looking at in the uk from south africa with that knowledge i think is is incredibly incredibly important so i do have a video here for you guys i just want to show you this is one of our our sourcing agents all the way in Wales, Chuck called John, you'll, you'll recognize the accent when he talks, he's a South African. Um, and he just <laughs> shows you the typical type of property deal um, that you are able to find in the UK market. So let me just bring the video up for you. So this is John. Hi, it's John Stoker here, just having a look through a property in South Wales. This is a prime example of what we buy for our clients, usually in the region of between 40, to 65,000 pounds. We spend between 20 to 30,000 pounds rectifying them and then we put them back on the market between 90 and 120, 130,000 pounds. Or if the clients want to retain them, we put them back on 
and they can then rent them out and recoup all their money after refinance, etc. I'll just walk you through quickly, just to give you an idea. Beautiful in the valleys, if you can see with the sunshine. Anyway, um, showing you condition. Um, sort of things that we're looking for, we'd be looking for damp on the walls. Uh, I'm trying to do that. Yeah, Ooh. damp on the walls that we're looking at rectifying. Um, if we walk through, we can see the kitchen. Sorry, it's getting dark a little bit early here, but dated kitchen, which would be completely ripped out. And if we walk back here, just back here, go into lovely downstairs bog and shower, which again we would rip out to try and force the value. Um, one of the most important things that we do in South Wales is we have access to the local authority houses to homes loans, uh, which when you pay cash for these properties, allows them to give you a loan, an interest free no payments loan for up to £25,000 to help refurbish the property and that will be paid off once you sell or rent out the house. Okay, so this specific house again, uh, you can see a little bit of damage from the outside, some more water coming through. Um, we don't see that as a problem, we see that as an opportunity to be able to force value because the owner obviously can't sell the house for full market value. This one's uh, got another upstairs bog, another bedroom, and you can see over my shoulder, you can see some more damp. Again, not a problem, just an opportunity to uh, create additional value. And there's the third bedroom here, again with lovely views. And then let's go through to the little fourth bedroom. Okay. Just a tiny box room, fourth bedroom. So that's really an example of uh, a typical South Wales investment property. This one's on the market for 59,000. I believe the guy's sticking to his price, but uh, this one would be worth hmm, 85 to 90,000. So we'd have to get pretty keen on the price. But again, like I said, this is just a prime example of the sort of stuff that we find for international investors. We find it for you. We make sure that the numbers work before we even pass it on to investors. And we have the teams that we can uh, invite or introduce you to other teams and builders and all the rest to completely refurbish it up to pretty much new spec and then refinance out or sell it to take your money back out again. So again, it's been John Stoker, here in South Wales. Have a great day. Cheers. So really awesome there to see John and, and the, ty the types of things that he's able to, to do for South African clients. He, he, he's one of um, 12 sourcing agents uh, that focus on the Welsh market. Uh, we've also got sourcing agents throughout uh, England as well as Scotland, which we've just opened up now. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, obviously, area-wise, always dependent on strategy. So, so what are your plans? You know, what is your experience? What capital are you looking to invest? Um, and that's something we start to look at on the UK Discovery Series to point you in the right direction and have the right short, medium, and long-term plan uh, in place. Um, right, key principle number three, uh, you know, as we finish off here on the little presentation, uh, you know, for me, not a big believer in uh, uh, in the new build model. I always say to people, don't fall into it. Um, don't go down that 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 new build route, especially in the UK. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people end up buying just the one property that tie a lot of money up in it, a lot of capital, um, and and eff effectively, you know, that money stuck there for a long time. So. Uh, I, I think it's more of a speculator model. So it's, a, it's like buying a brand new car. It's, it's a new product. It's normally the developer. So stuff that I'm doing in Wales at the moment, you know, the, the one property we, we're purchasing, we're going to be knocking down. We're going to be building 12 luxury apartments. Um, the gross development value is, is over four million pounds in that particular project. So we're looking to sell that on as a brand new entity to retail buyers, uh, um, you know, whether they're investors, you know, and hoping the market's going to go up over time, or whether they're people looking for holiday, um, you know, holiday, um, you know, holiday accommodation. So for me, it's, it's more um, the, the developer, the one that makes the money, uh, more than the, you know, the person who's the end user. Um, I, I've been taught right from the start, 17 years into this deal, that money's made by adding value. So buying something below market value and adding value is, uh, is crucially, crucially important. Um, and, and even with perceived discounts. So the problem is obviously is a lot of people uh, or developers will discount a particular 
uh, development. Uh, and it looks like it's a, you know, discount. In the UK, if you send a, a surveyor in six months after you've bought, you've bought, you've bought a property at a discount, they will, they will value it for what you've bought it for because you haven't added any value. That's a key principle when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to, to surveying properties. Finance is very difficult, um, you know, in terms of financing properties over, uh, over there for investment purposes. When you're buying new bills at the bank saying they're not keen to finance them, that's normally a telltale sign. And then I think supply and demand, always check supply and demand. If you've got 50 investors, only 50 flats in a particular block, all looking to rent them out, that may impact the demand uh, for rentability and for saleability moving forward. Um, you know, I had a quick look over here and I just wanted to do a comparison. Uh, you know, if you have a look at some of the, the new build developments, more, more particularly in the Southeast, Neil, that's where a lot of people sort of focus on the UK and they think that's, you know, that's where you're going to buy, but you've got a two bedroom flat in Hampstead Manor for 14 million Rand. You know, you've got a, a, the courtyard at Greenwich Square for 6 million. You've got Manor Place uh, for 8 million Rand, you know, one and two bedroom flats. And, and that's not really what we're looking to get you into. What we're looking to get you into um, are, are dirty, smelly properties in Wales. And this is Belinda. She bought four properties uh, over the course of last year. This is the first property she bought in Wales. Bought that for £55,000. She's actually from Obai, just down the road over here. Um, she refurbished it, uh, 11200 uh, The valuation for uh, for that property, once the works have been done, 85 So she was able to refinance that property. And with that rental, I believe she increased the rental on that particular property. She was able to create cash flow from day one. Um, Martin and Casper, similar over here, purchased this one for 63 They're from Joburg, two lovely guys. Refurbished one that a bit more, 28,000. That's a mid terrace three bedroom property there, 28,050 pounds of the refurb, valued at 115. And then the, the rental there is 635. So, so they can actually do two things. And one thing we talk about on our discovery series is having two exit strategies. So they can either decide to sell the property and make a 15, 16 grand uh, profit, that's in pounds, not grands, uh, or they can decide to hold the property and put a uh, you know, put a tenant in the property and refinance that property, you know, release capital and create cash flow. So um, th that pretty much, you know, sums up where where we are on the key secret side of things, uh, Neil, from my side. Okay, um, no, great stuff. I, know, no, I think there's quite a lot, to obviously, to absorb, but I think it's it's it, it, it all fits in and it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I just want to just uh, refer to obviously the poll that came up and, you know, Peter, you're welcome to, to jump in as well. Because uh, first of all, you were talking about structures, you're talking about obviously costs to refurbish and that kind of thing. And I think there's a question and I'm encouraging the audience to please submit. I see the questions are starting to roll in and it's around capital, um, you know, when you first break into the market. And because uh, I obviously heard the word refinance, you know, and, and that kind of stuff, low interest rates and all these different types of things. So maybe just tell us what is the kind of startup capital that is needed for somebody that wants to break into the UK market for the first time? In the region of, of 600,000 brand um, would be would be a, a, the startup capital amount that that you that you would require to to buy your first first uh, property in the UK. But, but I'll just add to that, Neil. I think, I think one of the key things is, and we talk about this in Discovery Series, we talk about raising money. Um, and, and the great thing with being able to, to buy, do up, refinance, and, and obviously release, um, you release some of that initial investment back out to continue buying is um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your own money. I think the, the ability to access funding, <clears throat> equity from existing properties that you might want to purchase, angel investors, joint venture partners, and other things that you guys talk about um, in the South African market, just like we do in the UK market. That opportunity obviously does exist. I think 600,000 Rand as a starting point to get into some of the low entry deals like I've just shown you is, is probably a good place to be, um, you know, and then, you know, you can then start to build a portfolio leveraging that moving forward if that makes sense yeah absolutely there's a question that's coming and i think it's very important to get this out the way because i think there is a little bit of confusion in terms of how the investment works and somebody said how does this differ from sharemax now i don't know if anybody know what sharemax is sharemax is a company that obviously did syndicated investments and they really took your your capital they took the money into their bank accounts and they put that money into commercial property investments. And of course, they went belly up 
And uh, unfortunately, a lot of investors lost their money and they weren't in control of that finance. So maybe just, uh, I think, Sean and Peter, just from your perspective, maybe just clarify because the structure you're setting up is your own structure. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. think maybe just to, to, just to answer that question, just so that to clear the confusion of that. Yeah, let, let me let me kick off there. I mean, obviously, what we what we do with WealthTrack is we educate you first of all um, to research, you run due diligence on properties to be comfortable with the investment that you're going to make, um, and then as we take you through through the process, you know, the company uh, or the 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 um, the entity that you're going to set up in the UK, Neil, is entirely yours, 100% owned by you. Um, whoever you decide to be a shareholder within that company is your choice. Um, you know, the key thing we talk about with entity wise is making sure it's lendable and it's tax efficient at the same time. So a lot of questions around tax usually. Um, so, so we've got a, you know, I think that's a key point there to understand. In addition to that, you know, the, the bank accounts, everything is, is your own. So uh, WealthTrek doesn't believe in, uh, you know, effectively us doing the investment for you. Uh, it's, it's taking you through an educational process to give you the tools in your toolbox um, uh, and, and, and adding to that the team around you to be able to invest safely, securely, um, with certainty and, and with a certain amount of speed in the UK, um, you know, and not, not effectively give your money to someone else to do that for you. So we give you the tools, we give you the team, uh, and then it's up to you in terms of your investment strategy, looking at different opportunities in terms of what, what it is you're going to do. Okay, great. So what I want to do is just take another extension of that question, because and I think it's it's right to to tackle who the owners are, you know, what happens to the title deed. So a couple of questions that have emanated from that. Uh, do you, you have, and we say not do you have, do you, and when you say you, you are the owner of that property, uh, do you have the same type of ownership in the UK, such as sectional title versus full title? And this is a question from Neil Clarsons. Um, so are effectively, are you buying into a balance sheet in terms of sectional title? And maybe just explain in terms of what uh, that title. So John, John actually asked what happens to the title deeds. I would assume it's in the name of the company. Absolutely, 100% right. right. So, mm, you know, mm. uh, John, if you buy in, in, in an entity called uh, John Limited or whatever it might be, uh, obviously, the, the the title deeds of that property, uh, which which will you know generally be available online two to three months after you've purchased that on the land registry uh, website, um, that that will be in the name of the company, 100% owned by the company. So that's the first thing. The second thing is alluding to obviously sectional title in the UK, slightly different terminology. So in the UK, we have leasehold versus freehold. Freehold mm -hmm. is absolute title where. Um, you know, you own uh, the land, the building and everything to do with that property. I, I would say, Neil, 99.9% .9 of the properties that you're going to buy, like Pete's going to show you, like Belinda and, and uh, Casper and, and Martin, the ones that I showed you are freehold in nature. So, um, you know, you're buying something that you own, buildings, land, everything to do with that. If you're buying something smaller, a flat, okay, it may be a leasehold property, which means effectively you're renting um, a space within a building, okay, for a certain period of time. So that leaseholds are generally the, the length of a lease is somewhere between 99 to 125 years. As a standard, you have longer leases, uh, 999 years. You have share of freehold, which is slightly different as well. But let me just touch on that, that difference then. So freehold, absolute title, leasehold, you, you effectively, you know, the, the space that you are leasing, okay, from the freeholder for a certain period of time, 99 to 125 years, you will pay ground rent on an annual basis. You'll pay service charges or levies to upkeep that building, okay? Communal, um, you know, communal sort of areas, roofs, all that type of thing. Um, and, and, and you take it from there. But nothing wrong with leasehold, by the way. You can extend leases. The finance becomes a bit tricky when a lease falls under 70 years. So, so generally that, that, that type of thing from an extension perspective is not difficult at all. Um, you know, but but I would say 90, you know, houses is what we focus on in the mainstream will be freehold. So you'll have absolute title. Fantastic. Peter, I understand you've got some deals for, to show us. Um, do you want to maybe take us through? Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yes, I have, Neil. So let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. 
So, right. So, uh, yeah, guys, as I mentioned earlier, um, obviously I'm involved with Wealth Trek. So, as a result of that, I, I really needed to sort of hit the ground running and and walk the talk, as it were, and 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 buy property. If we're going to be teaching people how to invest in property, that's obviously something I need to do. So, um, I followed the process um, that was taught by Sean. Um, and, and I, uh, together with my wife, we set up an entity, um, we opened bank accounts, did all this remotely from South Africa. Um, both myself and my wife are equal shareholders in our little property business in the UK. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, um, we've just reserved our third deal um, and finished the refurb on our second property. So it's a, about to be rented out. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we, we are at this point. So, so um, mm -hmm. this is the first deal that, that I bought. Um, it's a freehold property um, in a, a lovely little town called Port Talbot. Um, it's, um, so, so you can see on the, on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, that is um, the property itself. Um, uh, on top of that is the deal sheet. So that's what you would get from the sourcing agent. Um, and, and some of, it, it is quite a, a lot of information on that document, but just some of the sort of key numbers that I got from the sourcing agent when I reserved the property is they always put in the asking price. So the asking price on um, this particular property was 50,000 um, pounds. The agreed sale, which was negotiated by the sourcing agent was 46,000 pounds. The estimated done up value once I had um, finished the refurb was at 85,000 um, pounds. And the estimated refurb cost was 20,000 pounds. So they'll always provide you with a, a list of what they think should be done and what the estimated costs would be. And, and they also provided me with the estimated rental. So the estimated rental was five, 525 pounds a month for this particular property. So let me, when, when, when we say that this was a, a fix me upper, um, they weren't kidding. Like when you, when you talk about dirty wow. smelly properties, <laughs> um, this was quintessentially that. So um, on the right hand side, you can see that's the, um, that's the look or, or, or the site that um, that greeted the sourcing agent when he opened that door. So yeah, <laughs> looks like a mail, site. Yeah, fresh <laughs> mail works, uh, works really well. Um, this property actually been vacant for a very long time. Um, you could see in the in the kitchen, which was almost non-existent, it had been boarded up. Um, so so yeah, it, it it subsequently this this property did qualify for council tax exemption. So if the property is in a, in, a, in a not good state, you can apply for council tax exemption. And then as soon as you put a tenant into the property, they are obviously liable for that council tax. So that's a, that was a nice little bonus. Just some more pictures. So upstairs, there was the, the bedroom um, and the reception room. So yeah, you know, it really was in um, a poor state of affairs and was really crying out for a for a for a decent DLC. establishment <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so it gets worse um so this was um the yard uh, i think what had been happening is either the neighbors or the people that had been living there didn't really want to take the trash out and put it into the dustbin and get it collected they just basically threw it into the yeah. into the garden um and and there's a, a a picture of the um picture of the bathroom um so so it was interestingly with this property is that the bathroom was downstairs um so you've got the reception room you've got the kitchen um and next door to the kitchen is a downstairs bathroom with a shower um and and from a south african's point of view i think that you i found that strange initially um but i think what's important is to look at it for yeah from not from the the type of properties and, and how we live here you've got to look at it what your tenants and, and the market that you're looking to appeal to require um 
So, so my first almost instinct was wanting to put the bathroom upstairs where the bedrooms are. And, and that would have been a mistake um, because uh, you, you could move the bathrooms upstairs and, and the shower upstairs at, at huge expense. Um, but the amount that you're going to spend versus the additional income in terms of rents you're going to get is negligible. And, and there's a rent ceiling that you can achieve in these sort of properties. And, you're, and, and the guys who live there, that's what they expect. They expect the bathroom to be downstairs in these sort of properties. So that was just a, an interesting. Um, so just to get onto the, onto the refurb, um, the refurb was done start to finish in five weeks. Um, the, the power team member that we used was Sean's builder, a guy by the name of Gareth, and just an absolutely phenomenal guy. I will, um, I'll play a video as, as soon as I'm finished this presentation. You can see what the end product looked like. But I've not been to site. Um, I haven't been to Port Talbot. Um, Gareth was obviously in Wales, and I was sitting in South Africa. Um, the nice thing about about the builder is um, he understands the spec and, and, and we obviously wanted to rent this property out. It was a buy to let spec. Um, and, and he just gets on and, and does the refurbishment. So, you know, you've got a standard sort of kitchen range that he uses, got standard carpets. So it really is reasonably hands off from my point of view. Um, he gets on and just and, and does it. You don't need to get heavily involved in choosing colors and um, you know types of tops in the kitchen. It's it's very much a hard wearing standard product that um, that is fitted. Um, Gareth would send weekly WhatsApp videos and and pictures, so I'd get weekly updates in terms of what was done um, and and have all these videos and pictures. In terms of the staged payments. Um, you know, the first payment was, was after rip out. Um, as soon as they'd ripped everything out and taken it back to its bones, I would then do three further payments thereafter based on completion milestones. Um, so you can see on the slide is, is just a little snapshot of what the schedule of works would be. It's, it's a little bit um, less detailed than what we are used to in South Africa, but what it really is is clear and concise in terms of what needs to be done and what sort of specification it's going to be done to. And then Gareth just basically got on and, 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 um, and did the refurb. Perfect. Uh, no, great. You know, we've had, uh, you know, Brexit, is that still an issue? And secondly, um, what about COVID? You know, has the effect on tenants uh, income and that kind of stuff? Has it been effect, that kind of stuff? Just hold on there, Pete. You, uh, just let uh, Sean, uh, while you set yourself up, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Um, I think uh, it's been an interesting, uh, well, first of all, Brexit was very interesting, Neil. Um, you know, I think it was uh, three years of uncertainty plus a year of trade negotiations, um, you know, led to a lot of uncertainty within the market. So a lot of people there that were saying, uh, you know, that they were keen to get involved, uh, but they held back because of Brexit. And uh, if you look at the fundamentals of the UK market, which we study on our UK discovery series, uh, affordability is absolutely fantastic, you know, in terms of what properties are worth versus what people earn. Uh, interest rates are an all-time low, so money is nice and cheap. Uh, you know, if you have a look at the fact that, um, you know, we've got very, very strong uh, uh, supply. Uh, and, well, sorry, we, we've got very strong demand, but very, very low supply. So, you know, there's been... Uh, issues within the UK property market for many years in terms of not building enough property. A, a report highlighted when I started in 2004 by a lady called Kate Parker. It's something we talk about on our UK discovery series. So um, that with employment, employment very, very strong within the UK markets at an all-time low even after the pandemic. So I think the pandemic happened. So we sort of had Brexit and then we had, uh, you know, as the trade negotiations had finished, we then went straight into COVID. And, 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 and COVID has highlighted how strong um, the property market is and what a vital cog it is within the UK property market. And I'll, I'll just let you into a couple of stats very quickly. Uh, demand increase for property uh, to, to purchase and to rent by 40%. Supply has only gone up by 3%. Rent applications, if you have a look at what Pete said there, 75 pounds more a month, okay, um, has, has gone up by 30%. I think, 
the, the key thing for me that I noticed at the end of last year when the UK went into its final hard lockdown um, was that the property market stayed open. So estate agents stayed open, um, you know, all that type of thing, uh, which, which really shows the vital cog it is in the, in the market. Lending is more competitive, um, valuation certainty. So there were some clauses written into valuations that happened within property at the beginning of last year by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, where they had obviously uncertainty clauses written into what they're prepared to value properties at. And at the end of last year, that was taken out and removed in its entirety. Um, 62 billion more property sales in 2020, a pandemic year versus 2019, which is quite interesting. Um, and, and I think the last 12 months have just shown, you know, what a buoyant, Pete mentioned the word buoyant, but the Welsh property market has increased by 16.7%, England by 13.3%. And Scotland by 12%. I know that looks a bit like a Six Nations rugby table uh, with Wales at the top, <laughs> um, yes. but it has been a, it has it has actually positively affected the market uh, 100%. Okay, Peter, I'm going to ask yeah. you if you could yeah. take down your video, and I'll tell you why. What I'm going to do is make a suggestion. I'm going to suggest that uh, we, we we obviously get your video. And for the audience here, I'm just very conscious of time because obviously we run a little bit over time before I move on to um, to Sean, just to close up, because uh, I think, you know, there has been one or two questions. Your, your, your final thoughts? Yeah, just in, just in terms of, you know, dealing um, with purchasing and refurbing the property from distance, um, it all worked re really, really smoothly. You know, we've got quality builders that um, are on the project, and as a result of that, everything went, went smoothly. So it was a it was a really good experience. Fantastic. No, well, that's great. I mean, and, and it's very encouraging. And, and if you look, start looking at those returns, you can get quite excited. Because there was one question, and Sean, I want you to wrap up, because obviously I want you to tell people how's the next step, if they want to start get going with this into the UK, what is the next step? But I want to talk about, and it's probably related to strategy, a question that came from Ricardo. And he said, what is the tax sale on the, rate, on, on the sale of the property? And added to that, what is the tax rate on capital growth in the UK and the implication in South Africa? I would assume you've got a cash flow strategy, you keep your assets in the UK, uh, that kind of thing. So you probably don't want to bring that cash back in South Africa. I'm not quite sure, but certainly maybe you can cover that and then maybe tell us what the next step is in sort of closing up uh, on the webinar here. Okay, I'll try and multitask and answer two questions. Okay, it is, it is a bit tough. Uh, sorry, it's quite a load. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, um, interesting enough, uh, you know, you talk about the tax rate. So just to, to touch on that, there is a double taxation treaty that exists between South Africa and the UK. So you don't get taxed twice effectively. Um, you know, I think it's important for people to use an accountant who've got knowledge of both sides, which, which is part of our, our longer term process with the guys that we work with. Um, is making sure you've got that advice on board. Um, very simply, buying through an entity. If you're buying and selling through an entity, there's no capital gains tax. You don't you don't uh, pay any capital gains tax for or when you sell that property within an entity that you've purchased it in uh, within the UK market. Okay, you are obviously subjected to corporation tax, which currently is 19%. So um, I, I would say it, it's it's you provided you buy within the right structure. Yeah, you can make it very tax efficient. Obviously, money, Neil, that you put into the company initially would be a director's loan. So you can withdraw that money, uh, you know, over time. And there's no tax payable on that, you know, moving forward. So there are ways and means to mitigate tax, I would say. Uh, avoid it, not evade it, because evade it will land you into, in the UK, they call it the Queen's HMO, House of Multiple Occupation, which is the last place we want any South Africans to end up. Um, so it's all about knowledge, okay? And knowledge is power at the end of the day, which is exactly what our UK Discovery Series is all about. So for those guys who are serious, not curious about the UK property market, we actually have a, a Discovery Series starting um, next week on the 26th of October. Uh, it's a four-part um, uh, online series, which is held on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Um, 120 minutes per session, so two hours per session effectively. It is a massive, massive value add in terms of being interactive. So questions, answers, homework, um, uh, workbooks, all that type of thing. Um, what we cover over those eight hours together, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is 7, p 7 p.m. start. Uh, Saturday morning is a 10 a.m. start. We're going to go through how to run the numbers, how to analyze property deals, how to find the right mortgage brokers, how to vet sourcing agents, 
Um, we're going to introduce you into cash flow properties, buy to let, social housing, houses of multiple occupation, which I've just mentioned, uh, but the legal ones, um, how to flip properties, so buy and sell, create capital profit, um, and work with builders from distance. Uh, you heard John in the, the earlier video talk about 0% interest free funding, so we'll talk a bit more about how to finance um, potentially finance some of your refurbs using government money at a 0% between three, five, even up to 10 years, um, you know, depending on what you want to do with the house. We'll go through a step-by-step -step process to follow when you're buying a property it is different, you know, in the UK compared to South Africa, there are slight complexities. So it's something you need to understand. Raising money, moving money in and out of South Africa, what's involved in terms of your annual allowances and so on. And then obviously hugely important structures to invest through to ensure uh, tax efficiency, but lendability at the same time, and then the type of people you need to surround yourself with within, within the UK. Um, like I said, 26th of October, the investment is very small, I think, 999 bucks, uh, unbeatable value for me, eight hours content share. Uh, we limit the, the classes to 30 people, so we're going to have more than 30 people on a class, so we can give as much individual attention over those eight hours. I believe we've had a couple of webinars already. Uh, the team is telling me we've got five places left. Um, and the next series is all the way in June of 2022. So it's a great time to get started now, get things set up before you move into the UK. I believe that the chat box, the link will be in the chat box to, to book uh, one of those spots that are available. So, uh, you know, for anyone who is, is serious, sorry, I've just got someone in my ear now telling me uh, there are three spots available. Uh, you know, it would be okay. great to have you guys. <laughs> great to have right, you guys. They're moving fast. They're moving great fast. Great stuff. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I think, you know, Sean and Peter, thank you very much. I think, you know, we've just run out a little bit of time. The interesting thing is a lot of people have actually stayed on. They haven't disappeared, <laughs> which is very encouraging. But, you know, I've got to be uh, respectful of people's time. We did say just over sure. an hour. So what we will do, Peter, we'll take your video. We'll drop that in uh, just so that everybody knows. I wanted to see it. I just, we unfortunately, we did run out. And we will add. So we will send everybody a link of that. I think it's been extremely interesting. I think it's been, uh, and I mean, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, what both of you have uh, presented here today. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but that's been the conclusion of the, the webinar today. And I want to thank both Sean Thompson and Peter Martinez, uh, our expert UK investors, for your valuable insights uh, today. And also to Wallstrek for being the sponsors for today. And I encourage everybody that has been on the webinar, please, to engage directly with Sean and Peter Sign up for the training if you're not so done it already. I mean, as, as Sean says, there's uh, only space for three more. And uh, to you, the audience, I just want to thank you for joining us and uh, your participation. I want to end off just with an inspirational quote. And I haven't quoted Robert Kiyosaki for quite a long time, even though I've interviewed him more than six times. And, uh, and he has some really wise words to say, specifically on real estate. And he says, the rich buy assets. The poor only have expenses. The middle class buy liabilities that they think are assets. The poor and middle class work for money and the rich have money working for them. And I certainly think this is what uh, sums up from, in my mind what the wealth trick investments are all about. So thank you guys. Thank you once again. 